Everyone? Yes, awesome. I will begin thanking the Naval War College for allowing us to use the venue today, sir. Appreciate it. We are honored here in Newport to enjoy many special visitors, but few are as key to what the Navy is currently undertaking as, as is our speaker today, the Honorable Juan M. Garcia III, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Thanks, XO. Appreciate it. Thanks, shipmates, Marines, uh, XO. Thanks for having us. Thanks for letting us use this beautiful facility and the jewel of the Navy. Uh, Captain Knight, uh, congratulations and thanks for your retirement is in June after 30 years, three decades of service uh, as a distinguished naval aviator. Uh, it's good to see you again. My wife, by the way, likes to say, uh, uh, used to like to say, uh, you know how you're, you know when you're halfway through a date with a naval aviator when he says, but enough about flying, let's talk about me. That's the halfway point, you're officially there. Uh, had a great session at lunch with the uh, Command Master Chiefs. I got a lot out of it. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, and I've got the hair on the back uh, standing up from seeing those Smokey Bear uh, DIs when I walked in. I was an old AOCS guy. Uh, thanks for bringing back a lot of nightmares and for being here, uh, guys. Um, uh, we're on the road uh, hitting all the fleet concentration centers really for, uh, uh, for three reasons. One is as, as we roll into uh, a new national defense strategy with a new national defense budget um, and a time of, uh, over the past year, uh, enormous or significant uh, personnel policy changes. We wanted to come and, uh, and address those, um, convey the rationale and where we're going in the uh, uh, moving forward. We wanted to speak to uh, a major new initiative that, the, that SECNAV and the Commandant and the CNO rolled out a couple weeks back aboard Bataan called 21st Century Sailor and Marine. I want to walk through the uh, mechanics of that. But I also want to, uh, the primary reason we're here is to say to a force that 10 years into the longest sustained combat operations in American history, uh, with what's been a uh, often brutal and very challenging operational tempo, minimum dwell time for a lot of you and your shipmates and your fellow Marines, uh, to say thank you uh, and thank your families uh, for what's been a, uh, a very challenging period. Um, I like to, I want to convey that the work you're doing is having, whether you know it or not, is having enormous global geopolitical implications every single day. Um, and you and your shipmates are driving that. I, I, I want to share a story that's in, that's in real time to give you, a, I think, a pretty dramatic example of that. You'll remember, if you're following the news, just a couple weeks ago, Stennis and her battle group out chopped through the, uh, uh, the Strait of Hormuz, leaving the Gulf. And at the time, uh, the Iranians, elements within the Iranian government, threatened that this would be the last U.S. Navy ship to go through the Strait. Remember this? Threatened to bottle up the Strait of Hormuz, and with it, a quarter of the world's uh, oil, with all the implications that has for the heating of the American Northeast and the uh, um, uh, lubricating our industry and for fuel prices and for employment and for the worldwide economy. An Iranian general doubled down two days after that and said, we are not bluffing. This is the last Navy ship. So Stennis uh, leaves the uh, strait, continues to uh, uh, patrol in the area, and they get intel that there's a civilian Iranian fishing ship. Well, let me take a step back. So, so those announcements you know, pressurize a global situation. Uh, world leaders go to a heightened state of alert. Uh, enormous stakes. Stennis gets intel that a, an Iranian civilian fishing ship is exhibiting odd behavior, and they're, they're keeping an eye on it. A French corvette actually approaches the Iranian, Iranian uh, fisher, makes a contact on a common frequency, and the Iranian skipper says, no, everything's fine, normal transit. What the French skipper couldn't have known as he pulled away is that that Iranian fisher conveyed that message with weapons trained on him from uh, uh, pirates who had hijacked the ship 30 days earlier and were using it as a mothership to uh, interdict uh, traffic in the area there. Stennis knew something wasn't quite right. They kept an eye on it, and eventually they sent over uh, a destroyer, the kid, Kid established, established a comms, 
And aboard the kid was a snipe, uh, an engineman, not even a dedicated linguist, who happened to be a native Urdu speaker. The Iranians speak Urdu, the, uh, the, the pirates, the Somalis do not. So now the uh, Iranian skipper, even though he had the we same weapons trained on him, was able to convey that they, in fact, they were in distress, they had been hijacked. Sent over a, uh, a VBAS boarding team, secured the pirates, took them down, uh, uh, and saved the day. Instantly, that, that you know, E3 Urdu speaker depressurized and changed a heightened alert, geopolitical, uh, high stakes game because it makes it very difficult for the Iranian brass uh, to threaten to blow up or torpedo a US ship when we're out rescuing their own people. Change the course of events. Now, my favorite part of the story, go ahead, Matt, is this is the Iranian skipper. Now, keep in mind, all he's heard his entire adult life is anti American propaganda, right? The great Satan, the great oppressor. But this is the reception he gives the first US Navy sailor he's ever met in his life. Uh, now the best part of the story, I think, is after the pirates were transferred over to Stennis, after our guys gave the, uh, the Iranian fishermen uh, MREs and water and uh, did a health check and, and assessed the seaworthiness of their craft and sent them on the way back home, uh, our guys said all the Iranian fishers were standing on the deck as they pulled away, waving, smiling, and wearing U.S. Navy ball caps as they made their way back to Iran. I'm not sure what kind of reaction uh, they got when they got back home. Um, so I mentioned a year of, uh, of significant um, policy change. And I want to speak to that and kind of tell you where we, how we got there, what the rationale was, and what it means going forward. Um, let me start with uh, ERB, the Enlisted Retention Board that took place in November. Um, so our, our PTS, Perform to Serve System, was working, I think, like, exactly like it, on paper it was designed to work. The problem was, of course, that no one ever uh, imagined or anticipated the level of retention we're experiencing right now. PTS just wasn't built for 107% of retention goal, 130% in some key uh, uh, rates in NECs. So you know, we can debate about why that is. Some people say it's a function of a, of a challenged economy on the outside. Some people say it's proof that our compensation package uh, for our own folks has finally caught up in a meaningful way uh, to our civilian counterparts. I think th those, are, those are both fair. I think there's a third factor. I think there's a generation, I think I'm looking at them, who wants to be a part of the defining issues of their time. But whatever it is, no one's leaving. And as a result, uh, our, our force was out of balance. Great sailors, great sailors who had bad timing and were in tough rates uh, when their reenlistment window came up, uh, were being asked to leave. We were out of balance. As the CNO put it, it's like a football team with, uh, with all tight ends and no running backs. It just uh, it wasn't working. So we worked at the margins to try to, uh, uh, to, try to work towards that balance. Um, uh, tinkered with, uh, with ratcheting up higher tenure. Um, that gave some yield, not enough to uh, affect our numbers. We did uh, start Chiefs Continuations Boards. Uh, did a 0506 CERB. Um, we're still out of balance. Uh, made it easier, facilitated the transition from AC to RC, including letting folks out of their active duty commitment early to try to drive down that overmanning. Had some yield, not enough. Um, put in measures in those key overman rates where folks could leave completely, walk away uh, early on their obligation. Some yield, not enough. So the decision was made to do uh, a one time only single swath across the force to address the PTS backlog and the imbalance with an enlisted retention board. Scrub the jackets of 16,000 sailors to get to 3,000, 1% of the force uh, that would be asked to transition to the next part of their career. Um, uh, my message for, for the sailors here is, uh, uh, and for their families is twofold. One, um, if you made it through the ERB, um, I want you and your families to know there's not going to be an ERB this year. There's not going to be an ERB next year. There's no plans to do one in 14, and hopefully we never have to ERB again. We are, that was in November, at the, at the, at the worst part of the nadir of the backed up choke point uh, PTS system, we were seeing in those key overmanned rates about a 30% likelihood of picking up a successful retention quota. A few months down the road now, we're in May, and it's north of 70%. 
80 and 90 percent in a lot of key rates. And not only that, as we are discussing at lunch, sailors are finding out and getting notification about their quota much earlier in the process uh, so they and their families can plan and not bumping up against the fourth look, fifth look, sixth look where the anxiety uh, really kicks in. We think there will be a, um, a significant major uh, increase in promotion opportunities and, um, and advancement this coming cycle as a function of the uh, ERB. Uh, the second piece, and this is from the CNO, uh, that I hope, uh, hope you'll take home and, and share with your shipmates, is that it was a difficult, agonizing process, and we're going to part ways with a lot of great sailors, many of whom uh, over the course of the last decade have had a combat deployment, two combat deployments, three combat deployments. And that's why uh, we're determined to have the most optimum transition in the history of the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, every, every one of those sailors who we can keep on the reserve side and they can realize a, a retirement uh, in that fashion, we're going to do so. Every one of those sailors we can keep on the team in the uh, civilian capacity, one of our CISCOMs or, or, or another uh, venue, we're going to do so. You're, hopefully you're hearing about programs like uh, uh, shipmate to workmate, uh, helmets to hard hats, along with uh, ISP and voluntary separation pay. Uh, they and their families will have access to the exchange commissary uh, for two years. Health care for they and their families for six months with an option to extend that for another 18 months. Uh, if they'll have 15 years service by September 1, they'll, they'll receive early retirement. Uh, we've brought on for the first time what I think is the preeminent um, headhunter firm, uh, CGC, to provide individualized coaching and preparation, resume writing, uh, videotape to interview uh, practice, along with the actual job hunt search uh, to help these sailors uh, uh, transition and have as soft a landing as possible. Um, um, end strength, end strength. Um, much like our uh, uh, effort to put the force back in balance, uh, we are at the, uh, the size we'll need to execute the new national defense strategy for the next 10 years. Now, they'll be tinkering at the edges as we work to continue to keep the force in balance. But uh, compared to the challenges our, uh, our brother Marines are going to go through, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that shortly, um, you know, they're going to come down 20,000 Marines over the next five years. Our, uh, our brethren in the Army will come down 80,000 soldiers in the same time period. Your Navy is where it's going to be uh, for the next decade. For the Marines, uh, as you all know, uh, the Marines grew after 9-11 to, uh, to fight the war. Um, and the anticipation was always that the Corps would get smaller when things wrapped up in Iraq and uh, throttled back in Afghanistan. Um, and that's true. We're going to come down about 5,000 Marines a year for the next four years. But that'll still leave us with a Corps bigger than it was on 9-11. And as you would anticipate, as you would anticipate, your Marine Corps leaders, your commandant, is committed uh, to not breaking faith. So we're going to come down 20,000 Marines, and we're going to do so without breaking a contract, without uh, denying retirement to a, uh, uh, to a staff sergeant or a major. Um, we're going to do so with, uh, with Marine in reserve and strength won't come down a single Marine. So a lot of those Marines who don't pick up a boat space or another contract will have the opportunity to transition to the reserve side and get to 20 years that way. And we're going to do so without, uh, without slowing accessions. So we have a hole down 10 years down the road. So uh, we think we can get there on the core with natural attrition. As you know, the Marine model is different. You know, only 75% uh, only, uh, of Marines are, are one-termers only. So we think we can honor and keep faith with our career Marines and still reach the numbers we need to. Um, tuition assistance, tuition assistance, we know we know what an uh, invaluable recruiting and retention tool uh, that is for our folks. That's why 8,000 sailors last year, sailors and Marines, earned degrees uh, uh, through TA funding. But we also know that uh, the TA is not uh, uh, funded through the Department of the Navy. It's funded through DOD. And they have a $500 billion bill over the next uh, 10 years. So funding's going to come down. The, the numbers are still being worked. I think the way it will play out, it'll, it'll look something like this, that 250 to $225 dollar, or dollars per hour class will come down and look something more like 175 So that's why you're seeing and will see uh, a slew of policy changes to help ensure that we stretch that TA as far as we can and we can give it to as many sailors as possible so, uh, and Marines. So we'll require folks to be in a command for a year uh, before they, they take TA so they get a feel for the, the rhythm of the battle, of the, uh, the watch bill and the operational tempo, and they're sure they can take this on. 
uh, will require folks to have an educational plan on, on file that leads to a vocational certificate or a degree. Uh, so we ensure this, um, this money is being used wisely. You'll have to have a good PFT. Um, uh, no longer will TA go to PhD programs. It's a luxury we'd love to have, uh, but, uh, but we can't right now. We want to make sure as many sailors as possible and Marines as possible can use it to get associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. Uh, and we will, uh, we will require a sailor or Marine who takes TA and then drops a course or downs it or fails it uh, to pay that back so that uh, so we can make it stretch for, uh, for more of their shipmates. Um, compensation. Been a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of media coverage in the past year on uh, potential changes to the, uh, uh, to the overall compensation package. And here's my message for you uh, and your families. Let's start with pay. Uh, Department of Defense has that $500 billion bill over the next 10 years, but you're not going to lose a dollar. In fact, we'll continue to have a pay raise next year, 1.7% another 1.7% the year after that, and in the remaining years of the, the fit-up, the, the five-year defense plan, we'll continue to have uh, pay raises. They'll be more modest, but pay will continue to go up. Uh, healthcare. Healthcare. Uh, they say uh, a third of the DOD's budget right now is personnel costs, and 50% of that is healthcare costs. They're through the roof. Uh, former SecDef Gates famously described uh, 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 the Pentagon as a... Uh, a giant HMO that occasionally fights wars. Um, here's what, here's the, the message for you and your families. Um, the proposed changes, the proposed changes to health care are for working age retirees. That's folks who have already retired but are not yet 65. And those proposed changes, if they go forward, will be things like um, uh, increased enrollment fees and, and co-pays. Still, uh, uh, TRICARE will remain the best deal in the world. And uh, probably the most dramatic example, the biggest uh, uh, bill payer will be um, incentivizing um, pharmacy prescriptions. Uh, it'll be much more expensive to go to a, um, a commercial outlet, a CVS or a Walgreens or a Walmart, because that's the most expensive way we get our, our, our personnel get their uh, prescriptions filled. And we'll incentivize instead folks doing it online or going to an MTF. But for you, for folks on active duty, folks on active duty and their families, you'll continue to pay for your health care the way we always have, through your sweat and your work, but you won't reach into your wallet uh, to, pay, to pay a dollar for it. No changes for you. Um, uh, retirement. If, if you follow this stuff, you probably heard that uh, a couple months ago, a, a really uh, prominent Defense Advisory Board, an outside group that advises the Pentagon, made a recommendation that we shift to a, a 401k style uh, plan like much of the uh, civilian world has. And you're going to read more about that. There's going to be a study of probably a blue ribbon commission to assess that, whether we should go to a 401k or some sort of hybrid. But the message to you and to your families is that if you're in a uniform now, if you've stood on yellow footprints or raised your right hand, you will be grandfathered in to the program we have now. That's from SecNav, SecDef, POTUS. Uh, no change for you. You'll have access to the traditional 20-year um, military retirement we've always known. Um, fleet size. Fleet size, we're at uh, 287 ships today. We'll be at 287 uh, next year, and by 2019, we'll have a 300-ship Navy. Uh, we're committed to 11 aircraft carriers, uh, committed investing in uh, 55 LCSs, the new, uh, the new class ship, littoral combat ship. Uh, P-8, we saw it bounce the other day down in Jacksonville. It's here. Uh, the Commandant has a dedicated computer that monitors nothing but JC, uh, JSF progress uh, all day, every day. Uh, that's here. It's going to happen. So your fleet is, uh, uh, this is the size structure, the end strength, and the, uh, uh, the hardware that we need to execute the new national defense strategy. Deployment links. Uh, you may have shipmates or fellow Marines uh, or no folks who were on the um, uh, baton when they came back a couple months ago. And you might be aware they had a 10 and a half month cruise. And a lot of uh, attention or suggestions have been generated that that's going to be the new model. Uh, and that's not the case. Baton, uh, baton's deployment length was a function of uh, 
just a perfect storm of natural disasters and operational contingencies and some maintenance issues that all came together uh, to keep them out as long as they did, one of the longest deployments in, uh, uh, in a couple decades. But that's not the new model. This year, this year five ind independent deployers, uh, five ships will go out for, uh, for eight months. Next year, uh, six, a half a dozen are scheduled to do eight-month deployments. But the rest of the fleet, the rest of the force, will, um, will continue on the six to seven-month cruise length that we've known the last couple years. Uh, obviously, the uh, natural disasters have a vote in that. Uh, operational contingencies have a vote in that. Uh, but that's the guidance our combatant commanders have, and that's the, uh, uh, the planning we're working under. Um, OK, go ahead, Matt. Recognize this guy, fellas? Uh, this is uh, that species of human bit pit bull we call the United States Marine Corps drill instructor. And uh, uh, I share the picture to make the point that uh, the outside analysts uh, tell us that right now only one in four, 25 percent of 17 to 24 year old Americans are legally, morally, medically eligible to serve in a uniform. Only, uh, only 25 percent. But of that 25 percent, uh, I think we're getting the cream of it. I think we're getting the cream of it. Never been harder to get in the Navy and Marine Corps. Never been harder to stay in the Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, it's a year-long uh, wait uh, in a depth for most folks. Uh, by any objective measure, ASVAB score, AFQT score, traditional education background, technical savvy, uh, language capability, we've never been here before. The, the nation has never uh, uh, been the beneficiary of a higher quality uh, recruit. Now, uh, Marines, I will tell you that I went through the old uh, AOCS down in Pensacola like the captain did. Uh, and he and I were discussing this morning that after 30 years of service, he can still tell you the name of his uh, DI as I can. They change your lives. But mine gave me my, probably my single, single favorite line of my life. I, I took a weird path. I went from Harvard Law School down to Pensacola and Staff Sergeant Mike Sinat, United States Marine Corps. And one day as he's got us uh, you know, down doing push-ups in, in puddles of our own sweat, he leans in and he goes, Garcia, I wish I went to Harvard so I'd be smart enough to know how you can be so stupid. Give me 100 more of those. <laughs> um, we got to have, we got to get that that best of the 25% uh, that's eligible. We got to continue uh, to get the best of that best. Um, go ahead, Matt. Um, you all, many of you, I suspect, are so close to it that I don't know if you have a sense um, for the impact that you and your uh, shipmates have had over the past year. When I'm the Navy manpower guy. When I tell the manpower story, I go back to that, week, that one week period, five day period we had a year ago last April, where if you'll recall, in one five day period, we had, Japan had just had its historic earthquake and tsunami. Within 48 hours, 22 Navy ships on station, the Reagan, um, Navy helicopters ferrying back uh, uh, fuel, water, blankets, uh, food. 2,000 Marines on the ground, despite the radiation risk, doing search and rescue. At one point, a U.S. Navy barge is tied up to the reactor, providing the water to the reactor at Fukushima, literally uh, to prevent a unimaginable um, uh, meltdown. That same week, that same week, we're on the other side of the world in the Mediterranean off the coast of Libya, kicking off what would become to be known as Operation Odyssey Dawn, uh, stopping a the, the combat debut of SSGN, if we have any submariners in here, uh, stopping a madman from uh, exterminating, in his own word, in his own words, exterminating thousands of innocent civilians like rats. That same week, same five day period, we do our annual ISEX, send two submarines up under the polar cap in the North Pole to maintain that capability and understand the implications of climate change across the globe. That same week, uh, we're doing uh, Operation Continuing Promise out in the, uh, Central in the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, with the Central American, South American allies and partners, uh, engaging with them because, as the CNO has said, equally as important as winning wars is preventing wars. That same week, obviously, we're uh, chasing pirates off the Horn of Africa, um, ensuring the free flow of goods and trade, uh, so critical to a working world economy. That same week, uh, obviously, we're in the middle of OIF and OEF. That's one week in your Navy and Marine Corps team. No other, no other uh, Navy in the world has that kind of global reach and span and capability. No other Navy in the world is, it, it can be that kind of global force for good. We have to have the best talent, and we've got to keep the best talent. We've got to find a way to retain it. Um, uh, when you think about 
the mission set the nation requires its Navy and Marine Corps team uh, to execute right now. It's never been wider. Uh, it's never been uh, broader. I mean, as we speak, um, uh, obviously we've wrapped up in Iraq, but continue to fight a, a vicious uh, battle against a brutal enemy in uh, Afghanistan. But last week, last week, we sent our West Coast hospital ship, as we do every year, every other year, uh, the Mercy, out to a handful of the poorest nations in that side of the world. They'll do a four-month cruise. We know from previous deployments that when the inhabitants of those nations, many of whom have never had access to a medical professional in their lives, when they see a big military ship anchored off the coast, they'll, they'll presume the worst. Instead, what they'll experience is we'll debark hundreds of Navy doctors, nurses, corpsmen, medical professionals. Over the course of their cruise, they will fix dozens of cleft palates. They will prescribe medicine to people who've never had it before. They will deworm their animals. They'll purify water. Uh, they will put glasses, prescribe, give away glasses to people who've never seen clearly before, thousands of them, uh, so that for the rest of their lives, those people will wake up and see the world uh, through lenses given them by the United States Navy. It's not charity. It's, it's strategic. It's, it's based on this idea, as I, as I said before, that equally as important as winning wars is preventing wars, and it makes it really, really difficult uh, for groups like uh, Al-Qaeda to recruit. It's a tough act to follow and a tough uh, recruiting environment. Navy Marine Corps team that's operating so far out on the cutting edge of technology and science. It was Navy personnel who cracked the code on uh, the key components of GPS technology. It's become so much a part of our, our everyday lives. They got their arms around the, uh, the avian bird flu last year before it could spread and become a global pandemic. Uh, this summer, this summer, just a couple weeks, in RIMPAC, a big exercise on the, uh, off the West Coast, uh, we'll launch, we're calling the Great Green Fleet. It's like President Roosevelt launched the uh, the Great White Fleet. This will be the Great Green Fleet, where a carrier battle group, every asset within it, obviously the carrier and the submarines, but also the support ships, all the aircraft, uh, will be fueled by either nuclear or bio-reusable fuels, so that in the same way we don't rely on access to other countries' runways, we, because we bring our own, we won't rely on access to other countries' fuel and oil, because we bring our own. Um, Navy and Marine Corps team that, that leads the world in, in the number of patents on file, both public and private sector, um, Go ahead, Matt. Navy and Marine Corps team that uh, uh, is so far out on the cutting edge of technology and science that we're essentially providing a shipboard anti-ballistic missile defense over the entire free world right now, uh, but also maintains the capability of showing the world, as Dev Grew and SEAL Team 6 did just about a year ago, uh, that if you're the world's worst mass murderer, it may take us a decade, um, but we're going to find you. So against that backdrop, Against that backdrop, uh, knowing this mission set is this broad, knowing we're coming from 10 years, uh, the longest sustained combat operations in American history, we've asked a lot of our folks and their families, and knowing that the new national defense strategy, if you've had a chance to follow it, if you haven't, if you've had a chance to read it, I urge you to do so if you have not, uh, that remains focused on the, um, uh, on the Persian Gulf and Fifth Fleet, but now pivots and looks to the West and to the Pacific, and by any objective analysis, is a maritime strategy, is a sea services strategy, is a Navy and Marine Corps uh, strategy, which will mean there's very little reason to believe that our operational tempo is going to slow anytime soon. Uh, that against that backdrop, your leadership wanted to bring together um, all the uh, existing support programs for you and your families, those in development, and some new ones, bring them all together under an overarching rubric we're calling 21st century uh, sailor and marine. And the idea here is to ensure that our folks have the tools they need uh, to succeed and excel uh, uh, for, for both them and their families uh, in, the, uh, in the decade to come. So I'm going to urge you to go to the 21st century uh, website because it lists all of the respective programs and initiatives that you and your sailors and your marines should be taken advantage of. But what I'll do this afternoon, if it's OK, is I'll just highlight the five key focus areas and list a program or two under each one. Um, uh, one focus area is physical fitness. Uh, nobody needs to talk to the Marines about physical fitness. And the Navy P PT story is a good one. Anyone, Master Chief, Captain, anyone who's been around for a while knows that 15 years ago, our, our Navy looked very, very different. Uh, a Navy PRT was a gaggle of guys in a Led Zeppelin t-shirt, and uh, you know, the skipper would do the PRT in his backyard and bring in the numbers and hand them off to some. That's all over now. That's all over now. Our Navy looks different. 
Uh, PRT take rate, PFT rate, take rates have never been higher. Attrition rates have never been lower. There's real accountability. Down three uh, PFTs in four years, um, and you're, you're separating. Uh, so we want to uh, continue um, uh, to enhance that. We know that we can't, in this, in this new strategy, we can't lose sick days, injury days, um, man and woman work days due to injury or, or lack of fitness that might have been prevented. So every command in the Navy, uh, their, uh, their CFL, their, their uh, command fitness leader, uh, whether you're on a destroyer where the, uh, the gyms are being taken out in some cases, on a submarine which might have a treadmill or a stairmaster for the entire sh uh, crew to share, or in an expeditionary setting where you don't have any gym of any kind, your CFL is going to be trained on uh, fitness approaches and gear and equipment that can be, uh, that can be used in those settings uh, so our sailors know how to take care of themselves, uh, take care of their bodies, be at the top of their game. Fuel to fight. Fuel to fight is the new uh, uh, nutrition and food program. By the end of the calendar year, every galley, chow hall, mess hall, wardroom in the Navy or the Marine Corps at every meal uh, will have at least one entree and one side dish taken from the USDA's uh, most healthy options list. No one's going to tell you to eat your broccoli or that you got to eat your spinach, but you're going to have the most healthy options available out there, and you're going to be sm smart on how to take care of yourself. Um, continuum of service. Continuum of service. We talked about TA before. Um, we're also going to, going to uh, highlight, emphasize, and make as accessible as possible uh, GI Bill, PACE, NPACE, senior enlisted uh, education, uh, and ensure that for those sailors and Marines who do transition after serving their country and move on to the next phase of their life, that the academic work they took in their Navy and Marine Corps training translates to academic work uh, at a college or a university somewhere. And that the, uh, uh, the job training that they picked up during their time in their Navy uh, translates to vocational training and certificates at every state in the country uh, through programs like COOL, credentialing uh, uh, online. Uh, continuum of service. Ten years into this war, we've mobilized 67,000 um, reservists to go do IAs. Captain, you remember when we were JOs, um, you know, the, the, a lot of reserve service was kind of giggled at. There was, a, there was a running gag, I remember, in an aviation wardroom. Hey, it's Friday, lock up the desk, the reservists are coming in this weekend. That's all over. That's all over. It's a whole new uh, uh, reserve. And I always, tell, I always tell anybody who still has any questions about reserve capability or commitment, to, uh, from my office uh, in the Pentagon, to look out the window at, uh, at Arlington National Cemetery and all the guardsmen and reservists who've uh, given the last full measure. So we don't want to put that capability back on the shelf. We want to maintain an operational reserve. And instead of thinking about uh, two different teams that sometimes come together, it's going to be one team, one fight. So a process that used to take about 30 days to move from the AC to RC, that actually involved raising your hand and re-swearing in, now the, the metaphor, the way we want uh, sailors and Marines to think about it, is uh, it's one highway and you're just shifting lanes. So we used to take 30 days, it's going to take 48 to 72 hours. And the idea is that as, as uh, life's um, development and, uh, and incidents come up and they force you to consider serving on the reserve side, you're able to do so and then come back to the AC side uh, uh, when life situations change and vice versa. So we don't lose that training and that experience um, and that talent, especially after 10 years of war. We don't see that walk out the door and they were able to keep it. Inclusion, uh, inclusion. 300% um, more women uh, are in uniform than more, there were 30 years ago. Uh, we're doing pretty good on, uh, on finding talent to come in the door, but we still lag in retaining that talent. And what we learn, survey after survey tells us is that um, for many of our uh, female sailors and Marines, when uh, they and their family reach a time when they want to, want, to, want to have children and start building their family, that that becomes incompatible uh, with the Navy or Marine lifestyle and with the deployment schedule. So we're going to highlight a program called Career and Admission program, uh, program. We got to talk about it at lunch. Uh, and it's available to both genders. And the idea works like this. You apply for a one to three year period uh, and during that time, you can transition into the IRR, the inactive ready reserve. Now, you'll pick up a two-for-one obligation when you come back in. But during that one to three years, uh, you and your family will receive a stipend to your salary 
and continue to have health care, continue to have access to commissary and exchange, uh, have your, your uh, a PCS uh, move to a CONUS destination of your choice. Um, and when you do come back in, your lineal number, your year group will move back so you stay competitive with your peers and still have the opportunity to promote and advance. The idea is for a, a young family who wants to focus on small children for a year or two or three, or has a, a sick relative, or a sailor or marine who has a unique business opportunity, or a, um, a unique education opportunity, they're able to take advantage of it, stay on the team, come back in, and we don't see that, uh, that talent and that training and that experience walk out the door. We want to keep that talent. Um, safety. Safety. Um, um, I suspect, as every command in the Navy's had, you've just gone through a, a, a month of training on sexual assault. Um, and the last thing I want to do is, um, uh, you know, is speak in an accusatory tone. 99.99999% of our force are great Americans with nothing but integrity. Uh, but we've got a couple predators out there, and we're going to find them, and we're going to punch them in the face. And what this program does is highlight uh, uh, the training we've, done, we've given our NCIS agents so they know how to uh, uh, protect a crime scene and maximize the evidence. Uh, special training for our, our Marine Corps staff judge advocates and our, our Navy JAGs on the best prosecution strategies um, uh, where prosecution is appropriate. Every new sailor at their A school is going to receive bystander training because that's the demographic that is affected most so they know when to step in and take care of a shipmate. And every leader, every khaki leader, every chief and officer will get annual training to ensure we, we create a command environment where sailors do not hesitate, where there is no stigma to go to their leaders and say, uh, uh, there's been an incident that I want to report. Um, that's part of our commitment to, uh, to safety to our sailors. There's not going to be any more blue on blue incidents. Uh, now, probably the, um, another, another safety piece uh, to highlight one is, uh, is motorcycle safety. What you all do every single day in your professional life is dangerous enough. We don't want to lose sailors and Marines in their off duty hours. Now, this is a good news story. The, since the introduction of uh, uh, the required mandatory uh, basic rider training, motorcycle safety. Uh, mishaps or motorcycle mishaps are way, way down. Motorcycle safety is way, way up. But we've still got a loophole. We've still got a loophole. Last year, we lost 12 sailors um, to uh, motorcycle accidents. And in nine of those, nine fatalities, they'd had the basic course, but they never got around to the advanced course or the sport bike rider course. So we're going to close that loophole. We're going to use a, a forcing mechanism uh, to ensure that our folks, after the appropriate time and experience, move on and get that uh, uh, that second course, so we keep our folks as safe as possible. Now, the focus area that, without a doubt, has probably received the most attention uh, in the media and the blogosphere um, is the readiness piece, and specifically the introduction of uh, random alcohol breathalyzers. And I want you to, uh, I want to walk through the rationale and the mechanics of how this is going to work um, uh, and what it means going forward. And let me start off with this. It's a message for you and your shipmates. No one, no one in your leadership chain of command is interested in banning, prohibiting, stopping, ending, barring uh, the responsible legal use of alcohol, especially after the op tempo over the last 10 years. If that's your way to blow off steam and to relax, um, hey, you rate it. Uh, you've earned it. Just do so legally and responsibly. But the other side of that coin is, your leadership also would be irresponsible to ignore the data that comes across uh, the desk every single day in op rep form and the undeniable correlation. Uh, there's one common denominator across all our most pressing personnel problems, suicide, sexual assault, personal safety, uh, and that's booze. That's the, that's the wrong use of booze. 45% uh, of suicides involve uh, the misuse of alcohol. Uh, the correlation between sexual assault and alcohol is, is, is lockstep. Uh, we're still averaging 108 DUIs a month across the fleet. It's higher on the Marine Corps side, despite being a smaller force. Um, and it's not just one end of the chain of command. It's throughout the chain of command. Last year, of 20 relieved COs, uh, 20 CO reliefs that we studied, 13 of those reliefs involved an alcohol incident of some kind. So we wrestled with how, how do we preserve the ability for a stressed force that's been working their tails off for 10 years to blow off steam responsibly 
and at the same time address a culture and a problem that would be irresponsible not to do so. So we went back to our own history. And uh, uh, Catherine, you, you, might, you might assert, no, this is probably before your, your when did you commission? 82, okay, so in, in 1980, in 1980, the, um, not just the Navy and Marine Corps, across the DOD, a survey was taken, and it was determined that 27%, 27% of US service members had had an illicit drug in their system in the previous 30 days, 27%. That's in 80. In 81, Nimitz has their horrific mishap, uh, loses 14 sailors, six aircraft, tens of millions of dollars. And when the investigation is done, it's determined that the causal factor was drugs. That's 81. So in 82, the Department of the Navy initiates a uh, random drug year analysis. By the end of that decade, by the end of the 80s, the 27% figure had gone to 2.9%. Today, testing has refined. Every sailor and Marine knows that a positive drug kit is automatic administrative uh, separation proceedings. Uh, and today, we do about 160,000 random year analysis tests a year, 100,000 Navy, 60,000 Marine Corps, and the positive pop rate is 0.3%. This doesn't happen. It's statistically negligible. Everybody knows the, the fallout from that. So breathalyzer is not your analysis. Uh, they're going to be different. Your analysis is automatic administrative separation. separation. That's not the case with breathalyzer. Um, and let me preface this by saying that the idea here, the idea here, the last thing we want to do is scare sailors away from coming back to their ships. Breathalyzer will be for duty section personnel and sailors going to work, working on reactors, working on the world's most sophisticated, technologically advanced, and dangerous equipment in the world. We want sailors, if they're, if they're, if they're coming back to the ship to sleep one off or, uh, or out on their free time, NA, doesn't apply. This is for folks reporting for work. And unlike your analysis, the idea with breathalyzer is that it's not punitive. It's, it doesn't result in automatic administrative uh, process. It doesn't result in NJP. Now, if you're underage or you drove to the ship and couldn't walk across a brow, that's a different story. But the idea here is that it's not punitive. Instead, it's an additional leadership tool, additional leadership tool for Navy leaders, for chiefs, for LPOs to do what they do best, what they've always done, to lead. Intrusive leadership and be able to recognize that, hey, Garcia's been late twice this month and he blew a .05 um, on his duty day. I wonder if something's going on at home. Uh, I'm going to sit him down and see if I can get involved and uh, perhaps prevent a career debilitating incident or, God forbid, a, a life debilitating incident uh, before it happens. That's the concept with breathalyzer. So it was, it was piloted. It was tested out on the uh, um, uh, subpack Northwest. They had a 45% drop in ARIs, alcohol-related incidents. A lot of commands around the Navy, as you know, are way, way out ahead of this. At, uh, at SIG, they breathalyze every car coming through the gate every day. Um, this is not that. We're going we're to take this summer to beta test. Uh, we heard uh, the fleet master chiefs weighed in, and they said, we get it, but we want to make sure we administer this appropriately and fairly. And what worked on a submarine with one hatch might not work mechanically in the same way as a carrier or a shore command or a squadron hangar. So this summer, uh, we'll beta test at a representative sample of commands. We'll take the data from 4th of July weekend. We'll um, take the data from Labor Day weekend, compile best practices, lessons learned, uh, roll those into a SECNAV instruction uh, that will come out in the fall and uh, ensure we've got the, uh, the tools and mechanics in place to succeed. We already know the, uh, the four Marine beta sites. They've already started testing. As always, the Marines roll out first. Uh, the two PRP commands at Bangor and uh, Kings Bay and HMX and um, Camp David will be their, uh, their beta test sites. Uh, we'll, we'll do the same with a representative uh, sample across the Navy. We'll have the hardware um, in every command uh, by the end of the calendar year. So um, uh, hit the website, 21st Century Sailor Marine. I've touched on just the, the bare minimum of, of programs that are out there. Um, and I'm not doing it justice, but you'll find on the website that there's an array of tools and initiatives designed to help your families uh, succeed and excel. Um, I'll close with this, and then if we have time to have a, a conversation or, or do some q and I'd love to do so. Um, I mentioned that uh, I started this by saying the work you and your shipmates and fellow Marines are doing is having enormous global geopolitical implications every single day. 
We had another great example recently that I like to talk about. Go ahead, man. This is Magellan Star. It's a German flagged oil tanker, civilian ship, uh, crewed by mostly uh, junior sailors from the Philippines and senior personnel from the Eastern European countries. Uh, sails with 19 sailors. And not too far back last year, it was making its transit through the uh, Gulf of Aden off the coast of Yemen. As everyone in this room knows, part of the world that's wrestling with the scourge of piracy. And in fact, the, the ship was attacked. They were swarmed by pirates. And per their procedure, once the crew became clear they weren't going to be able to stave off the pirates and, and fight them off, they, per their procedure, all 19 of them, they locked themselves in what they call their, uh, uh, their citadel, their safe space. They essentially weld themselves into their, uh, the steel walls of their engineering spaces and communicate with the satellite phone. So they got a mayday out. Uh, the USS Dubuque was patrolling in the area, had Marines aboard from the 15th Mew, one of whom I, I met this morning. Um, and in a daring, perfectly executed raid, this is a photo from it, uh, the Marines stormed the Magellan Star, took the ship down, secured the pirates, did it without firing a shot. They used these flash bombs to startle them and take them off guard, completely regained control of the ship. But in the meantime, but in the meantime, the ship's original crew, those 19 sailors still locked in their citadel, uh, had lost batteries on their sat phone. So they're not communicating with anybody. They're Nordo. They don't know what's going on outside. All they can hear is these flash bombs going off outside. So they don't know if it's good guys or bad guys. So they refuse to come out. And this standoff ensues. And eventually the Marines blow torch a hole through and try to, through the steel walls and try to pass notes that way. But with the language gap, uh, they still can't convince them it's safe to come out. So this goes on for a while. Eventually, one young Marine uh, tears the Velcro American flag patch off his shoulder and sticks it through the hole. And um, uh, you know, I raise this to make the point that uh, despite all our, uh, our uh, budgetary challenges, despite the uh, constant drumbeat of propaganda from our enemies, sometimes from quarters of our own media, uh, when that little cloth Velcro American flag went through that hole, that group of civilian sailors, non-English speakers from the other side of the world, instantly knew uh, that it was safe to come out, the good guys were here, the global force for good had arrived. So what you're doing is working, it's having an impact uh, every single day. Thank you for your work and the, the quiet patriotism of your families. And if I can ever answer any questions, we have time, I'd love to do so. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I've never had a, a Marine Corps uh, drill instructor in a Smoky Bear clap for me before. Thank you, guys. Uh, what's on your mind? What else can I clear up? Shipmate. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, BM2 is good worth, Naval Station Newport, Port Operations. Uh, my question has to do with um, motorcycle safety. Uh, from what I heard, we had three deaths recently in the past month or so. And I wanted to know if there was the Navy who was doing anything to kind of curve around uh, or increase motorcycle safety for our sailors uh, and Marines. Motorcycle. OK, great. Uh, thanks, EM2. Yeah, I, uh, I referred to this, and there, there's a whole section under the, the safety focus area in the 21st Century Sailor uh, and Marine website that I urge you to go check out. But in a nutshell, it works like this. Uh, all, all motorcycle riders are required to take the uh, safety course before they can get the bike on base. And that's been a great success story. The uh, motorcycle mishaps and God forbid fatalities have come way, way down. It's had a major, major impact. But we know we've still got a loophole. Last year, last year alone, we lost 12 sailors uh, on motorcycle accidents and nine of them had had the basic course, but they'd never gotten around. They were more than a year outside the basic course, but it never got around to either the sport bike course or the advanced course. And we didn't have a functioning mechanism to ensure that they do. Once they got that first sticker, they were good to go. It was up to the command to keep an eye on them or, or the sailor to take it upon themselves uh, to do that follow-up course. We're going to force that now. We're going to force it. Now. We're going to give them the appropriate amount of time, the appropriate amount of hours on the bike, and then take that sport bike course if, if they've got a 500cc bike or, or, or larger, and, the, uh, and then the advanced course, or, or the advanced course, so that uh, our folks are safe as possible. As I said, what you do every day in your professional life is dangerous enough. Uh, we don't want to lose sailors and Marines in their off hours. Thanks. What else? Shipmate. Good afternoon, sir. Ensign Kim from uh, Navy Supply Corps School. 
I read an article a few weeks ago about uh, what the public thought about what each branch of the military did, and the Navy came at last behind the Coast Guard. Yeah. So is there a mission uh, that you guys have to educate the public about what we're doing? Yeah, I, I read the same piece, and I, I, I was really stunned uh, um, that in a year that we've seen uh, uh, the takedown of, of bin Laden, uh, that the, uh, the Navy mission set as wide as it is, um, uh, over the past year, that those, that those poll results came in the way they did, I'd be really, really surprised. Um, and I'd like to really get into the, what they call the cross tabs of that poll and see how accurate it is. That said, I think most of America, out in the, uh, uh, the bulk of the country, they know that, uh, that Army soldiers and Marines have, uh, you know, the nature of this fight is such as been a, uh, uh, you know, a ground war, uh, eyeball to eyeball, neighborhood to neighborhood, and, um, and that's what they know. Those of them who, who've, who've been touched by a, know a wounded warrior or have a wounded warrior who's a, a neighbor, a relative, a friend of a friend, know that they're disproportionately um, uh, Army and Marine Corps. And I think, I suspect, to the level it's accurate, that's what drove that poll. Now, of course, as everyone in this room knows, uh, uh, the Navy has given disproportionately as well, and there's a lot of Navy SEALs uh, at Bethesda, Walter Reed, at Bamsey in San Antonio, uh, EOD, um, Corman, Corman have, have, have given disproportionately. As you know, they embed with the Marines. When the shooting starts, they don't have the option to, uh, uh, to run for cover. They run to the wounded. Um, devil docks, as the, as the Corps calls them. Uh, so I think that's just a function of uh, uh, the demographics and the fact that uh, that's the bulk of, of wounded warriors. I think that'll change over time. And um, uh, when I compare our relative position to the other services, an army that's gonna have to come down 80,000 soldiers uh, that our, we've had folks on two, three deployments. They've had soldiers on seven, eight deployments. It's been brutal. And their 15-month model for the 15-month deployment model for the first half of the war, I think, has, uh, has really been devastating. Uh, uh, I like where we're at uh, as a Navy and a Marine Corps now. Plus, the world's going to get to see uh, a battleship this weekend, and that'll, that'll change everything. For me. <laughs> by the way, by the way, li little trivia. Do you know that uh, when the movie studio originally came to the Navy, the scenario they had in their movie, their script, and what they wanted you know, to use a carrier for and support ships and our, our personnel was for, that scenario called for us engaging in war with China. We thought, ah, let's hold off on that. And so the, uh, uh, the script instead morphed to battling aliens. And so um, go figure. What else? Please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Ensign Rodriguez from the LDO Warrant Officer class. Uh, what's the future of uh, Navy IAs? Uh, Navy IAs, great question, great question. Um, uh, had lunch with uh, the CMC from the, uh, uh, the clinic here, and I know that, I mentioned Corman before, I know, uh, like a lot of rates, our hospitals and clinics have paid because so many of our corpsmen have done multiple IAs. But that's true all across the waterfront, and it's part of the big reason why we've been stretched thin over the last 10 years. Here's the word on IAs. Uh, by the end of this year, the, the entire IA mission uh, will be driven by reservists. We've got this reserve capability now, never been more operational, so we're gonna run that all off the reserve side. And that, uh, the IA mission itself will completely draw down within the next uh, uh, two to three years. We'll stop, we'll stop doing the non-core mission, that is the uh, detainee operations, the things that aren't Navy, that the Army is now, now the route of Iraq can handle themselves. We'll go down to our core operations, um, uh, uh, EOD, uh, cargo op, uh, maintenance, things like that. Uh, but we'll be out of the IA business in three years, and we're going to ask our reserve force to carry the load completely start at the end of this year. So thanks for the question. There's another one back there behind it. Covered? Okay. Please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, MM1 Gutierrez from the firefighting school here in uh, OTCN, best fire school in the Navy. <laughs> My question, sir, is I've um, been reading a lot of different articles. I'm involved with the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, great group. And um, there has been this uh, a lot of commotion about the VA, uh, mainly in help in different cities like Spokane, Washington. You have to wait about 80 days to be seen. Uh, Iowa City, Iowa, 124-day wait times. And uh, at the same time, over the last year, we have had this huge suicide rate of new veterans about 
the month of April, I believe it was 18 veterans committing suicide per day. That's one veteran committing suicide eight, every 80 minutes. So this is people who are committing suicide within the first year of separating from service. And it takes a long time from the VA to get them and process them. So what are we doing when we are handing off? Because we are getting rid of a lot of people, yep. not only in the Navy, but in the Marines and also in the Army. So what are we doing to make sure that this handing off is happening and the people who are leaving service in between the time that they don't get any more of this military medical service until the time they are seen by their local VA facility. So are, 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 is there a plan for TRICARE or something like that to yeah. continue to cover them for like maybe a year? Thanks, for Mr. Gutierrez. Great question. Uh, here's what we're doing. We know from the first half of the war that what's called the, uh, uh, the MEB-PEB process, the Medical Evaluation Board, Physical Evaluation Board, that each of the services conducts and then hands over to the VA. We know that there was big holes in it for the first half of the war. It's hard to say uh, uh, how much of that drove uh, individuals to, to, uh, to commit the ultimate act, but I don't doubt that it was a factor. So what was happening was there was a large, the, the process was moving along pretty fast, uh, but as a result, there was this gap where members received no benefits, no pay. They were off active duty, but VA hadn't picked them up. And that period could go for months, could go for a year. And my sense is that where, that's where the uh, uh, a disproportionate amount of the tragedies were happening. So we've changed that. We call it IDES now. We run both the, the, the VA portion and the DOD portion of the MEB, the PEB, simultaneously. They're parallel. They go in place at the same time. So the good news there, the good news there is that there's no more no man's land. There's no more period where you don't belong to DOD, you don't belong to VA, and you're without benefits, and you're out there injured, wounded, ill, without uh, any pay, out any benefits. Uh, that's all over. We've closed that gap. But the bad news is, in doing so, we've got a big backlog, and it's taken a long time to get through the process. And uh, it's a double-edged sword. Um, uh, for some sailors and Marines, I suspect the same is true for airmen and, uh, and for soldiers. Because they've had to wait to go through the MEB PEB, they've missed opportunities. If, you know, the semester has come, come and gone for school, or a great job opportunity came up, and they weren't processed out yet. Other folks say, hey, they're being, they're being moved out too fast. We want to go slow. We want to be ex as, as thorough as possible. And they, hey, don't put us out on the street until we've, we've, we've had our best shot. So the program is designed to get, to, uh, to get a member through in 295 days with, no, with a seamless handoff, with no loss in, uh, in benefits. The reality is across services, we're north of a year right now. The Navy and Marine Corps are doing a little better than the other services, as you would expect, but we're still north of a year. But as we get through this choke point, as we, as we draw down Iraq, that number's going to come down, and we hope to have it ultimately a 90-day process. You're taken care of. You know what any applicable benefits you, you have coming to you. You don't lose pay. You don't lose benefits. And, uh, and uh, it's going to have a lot less, a lot fewer of our shipmates and Marines in dire straits. Thanks. I think we have time for, for one more. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Ensign Hederly, as far as going green, uh, is there any timeline or set of goals for the future of where the Navy will be as far as going green? Oh, great. Uh, you're referring to, to green energy. Uh, this is a, a priority of this SECNAV, this uh, CNO, uh, this commandant. Marines are, are leading the way as we speak, as I suspect these gentlemen can attest to. Right now, operationally, Marines are out there forward uh, with uh, uh, solar power gear, not carrying uh, uh, batteries, um, uh, powering their AC organically out there. And the idea, the rationale, is there's an incredible stat that I don't want to quote because I don't have the, the, the numbers perfectly. But for every gallon of gas, every gallon of fuel that gets transported up to a FOB, to a forward operating base in Afghanistan, so it has to make its way through those roads where we're most vulnerable to IEDs and to attacks, uh, for a stunning, uh, a stunning ratio of gallons of fuel to Marines lost um, is the wrong way to do business. So the Secretary is committed to a, uh, uh, by 2016, um, uh, reducing our uh, carbon footprint, our operational requirement for fuel uh, by 50%. 50%. That's, that's uh, aircraft, ships, uh, uh, submarines obviously are all nuclear, and at our, our shore installations as well. And as I mentioned this summer, we'll highlight this capability. We'll highlight this capability at RIMPAC. President Roosevelt um, uh, uh, 
uh, said we launch a great white fleet when he had this job. Uh, we're going to launch this summer a great green fleet on RIMPAC where uh, the entire battle group, the carrier, obviously the submarines, support ships, aircraft, uh, all involved will be uh, fueled by either uh, uh, nuclear or bio-reusable fuel. We've tested it on every aircraft in the fleet right now. The first one was the Hornet. We launched it on, out, of Pax on, uh, out of Pax River on a uh, mustard seed, Camelina uh, uh, hybrid. Flew perfectly. We call it the Green Hornet now. And uh, um, uh, this summer we'll demonstrate it to the world and show that uh, 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 in the same way we don't rely on access to other countries' runways, because we bring our own, we won't rely on access to other countries' uh, fuel and oil recesses, uh, resources because uh, we bring our own. It's going to make us, it's not a, uh, we're not doing it because it's trendy or it's, um, it's in or because everyone's driving, driving uh, Priuses. We're doing it because it's operational and we can save Marines and uh, it increases our independence and we won't have to rely on allies that may be with us one day but not with us the next day. It'll make us better war fighters. Shipmates, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, enjoy this time in the jewel of the Navy at, at uh, Newport and we'll see you in the fleet. Thank you.